UNHCR in 1982 um, implemented the first obligatory rotation policy. Uh, this was emphasized as critically important, so all except a few top administrators have to go to the field. The Joint Inspection Unit has cited this. Subsequently, both UNDP and UNICEF have approached, not quite reached, UNACR's ability to turn people over. It seems to me that this creates a sense of equity and knowledge. It also leads to high divorce rates, but this is exactly the kind of thing that needs to happen. As Annan was leaving office, he, he said the thing that had to happen most, free, uh, most urgently uh, was a radical overhaul of the United Nations Secretariats, its rules, its structure, its systems, and its culture, indeed. The League of Nations instituted permanent contracts, a practice that was continued by the UN, uh, supposedly to protect staff from government pressure and arbitrary dismissal. These are the same kinds of arguments that are made in the academy about university tenure, and in fact the critics argue in exactly the same way, I being one of them, that removing the possibility of being let go or moving on leads to more coasting rather than more productivity. Well, one of the things that happened during Annan's tenure was that the number of permanent contracts were increasingly phased out. Now, I realize there may be problems uh, with institutional memory. You need certain kinds of administrators here and there. But it seems to me that the permanent or continuing contracts should be minimized, particularly for serious substantive jobs. And within the human rights arena, for example, I think the argument could be made that virtually no one should have a long contract should make a, a mark and get out. In fact, if a staff member were doing his or her job, governments would be wanting his or her head. Finally, let me look at the sustainable development arena for a couple of examples. It seems to me that what's really required is better intellectual firepower and younger people. Ideas are frankly like period pe people to take my earlier refrain, they matter for good and for ill. So we all are familiar with Keynes's remark that men and women who don't have time to read are often uh, led and, and uh, taking action on the basis of theories from dead scribblers or live ones like those in this room. Um, it seems to me that the role of powerful minds are really essential. We look to people like Hans Singer, I already mentioned Raoul Prebisch, the Caribbean's own Arthur Lewis, eight other Nobel laureates in economics. A contemporary example would be uh, Mahmoud al haq the Pakistani economist who launched the Human Development Report. Obviously, uh, calling a spade a shovel in numerical terms does not always make friends or fans among governments. There was an enormous pressure that UNDP should not continue with this. They insisted that it maintain its independence and lo and behold, by saying, following our, my favorite political scientist, Nancy Reagan, by just saying no, governments backed off. UNDP has continued um, to bring this report out. It continues to embarrass certain governments, rich and poor. It seems to me that at every level of the organization, there needs to be better leadership. And it seems to me that this is much more likely to come from people on short or fixed term contracts, specialized consultants and academics on leave rather than from permanent civil servants whose careers are dependent upon reactions from superiors and governments and who don't stay abreast of what's going on in the analytical or academic world. So it seems to me that the first step is to admit that this is one of the major activities, one of the major comparative advantages and to hire people for brief terms and allow them to make their contribution. The second is that donor governments obviously have to put up with the uh, notion that, that research and ideas and monitoring actually make a difference. The second part of this would involve, and obviously there are no silver bullets here either, but lowering the average age. It's hard to believe that the entry level average age in the UN, a P1, is 37 years old. The average age of the Secretariat as a whole is over 46. So there's a real opportunity in the next five years, I talked to the head of personnel, when about 15% of staff reach retirement age. 
Well, Adelaide Stevenson once joked that the work at the UN involves protocol and geritol and alcohol. Um, and it seems to me that relatively little can be done about diplomatic procedures or the consumption of uh, fermented beverages, either in New York or here. But it seems to me that sclerosis is a guarantee of mediocrity and have to find ways to get in younger people in. So yeah, let me, let me terminate here. Um, it doesn't seem to me that, obviously, I can't argue that the International Civil Service is the, uh, the most raging UN illness. We've got uh, other candidates for that, including uh, notions of national sovereignty and uh, vacuous uh, north-south debate. But it seems to me that the health of the second U UN is something that can be changed and therefore should be changed. Uh, indeed, the UNs, in spite of all the warts, its residual legitimacy keeps a surprisingly large number of competent people committed to its work. At the end of Annan's term, uh, he, uh, I mentioned his quote about investing in the United Nations. And interestingly, the so-called Four Nations Initiative, Chile, South Africa, Sweden, and Thailand, put together a think group to try to pull together what it would mean to uh, give meat to his recommendations. And they started off with the usual mantra of geographical representation, but I think that was for public consumption. They set that aside, and they actually moved to make several, several specific proposals about merit-based recruitment and promotion, short-term contracts, expert hearings for the most senior appointments. In short, they were seeking a way to reinvigorate the International Civil Service which is why I think the next Secretary General may take this on. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. How, we can, how many minutes do we have? Please. I, I can't see, so just. And if you've got a mic, that would help. Um, well, let me try both of those. The notion that, that a geographic uh, background is one indication of diversity is, is just fine with me. The problem is that these quotas are rigid. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're exactly the right person from the Netherlands, uh, you know, tant pis, you can't apply for these posts because there has to be somebody from an underrepresented place. It seems to me that, that, that this is remarkably akin to kind of affirmative action by in the, in the United States in particular, that you have to move beyond a single notion of what it is, uh, particularly in a, in a world in which, you know, if you're a Sudanese with a U.S. passport in, uh, in Chicago, it is, they, you know, what are you? Uh, or a new board member, Ramesh Thakur, who doesn't have an Indian passport, and that's what he is, but he's got four other passports. I mean, what does it mean, you know, what, should I get to use my, uh, this passport? So, it seems to me that this should be one notion, but certainly not the only one. <laughs> 